guys, welcome to Trinity Church Online. For more information, please visit us at ourtrinity.org or you can find us on Facebook at Trinity Church of Wheat Ridge or even on Instagram at Trinity Church CO. No matter where you are today, we are glad that you have joined us here. excited to get to heaven <laughs> right I can only imagine man every time I hear or sing that song or thinking about it it just sort of brings somewhat of a tear to my eye of excitement you know because we can truly only imagine what it's like so so you may have noticed uh, last week I hadn't I usually start off with honoring someone and last time I didn't you may not have noticed may not have noticed, I don't know um, but I noticed that they weren't here so I was like well Maybe I'll do it when they're here. And so I don't see them again, though. Um, but I'm going to actually honor them anyway because, uh, you know, I can't just keep holding off. So uh, the person that I wanted to honor today, his name uh, and his wife's name is Ron and Ruth Bland. Um, I don't know if you noticed, uh, but a couple weeks ago we had the graffiti, the, the spray paint in the front of our uh, church, you know, on the driveway there. And uh, he came up to me after church, and I knew once I brought this up, there were going to be people that had ideas and everything. Well, he was the first one that came up to me, and he said, he said, hey, do you know how you want to remove that? And I was like, no, not yet. And he said, well, I remove spray paint professionally um, from buildings and all that stuff. I was like, wow, that is a blessing. You know, that's an amazing thing. And so uh, he told me that he wants to do it. Uh, and so he went out, I'm assuming that Sunday afternoon, I'm not really sure, either Sunday or Monday, um, and removed it as much as he could. Uh, and you can see it a little bit, but he was talking to me about it. He's like, usually it's on the side of a building, and it doesn't get baked on as much as it does when it's on the ground. And so he said it was really baked on, um, but honestly, as much as he got it off is more than any of us probably could have gotten it off. And so I want to honor him. He also told me about sort of what he does. He works with a lot of uh, gang members and, and kind of rehabilitation and working with gang members that are in the Denver area. Um, so just kind of talking to him and, and seeing his ministry, I mean, it was a huge blessing. So I wanted to honor him and his wife today because um, they're just doing a lot of work out in the inner city, and um, it is definitely a great thing. So if they were here, I would have them, you can clap, but, you know, they're not here. So, <laughs> yeah, you can clap for them. How many of you know what congenital insensitivity to pain is, or CIPA? You know what it is? You've heard of it? So, what this is, is a condition where you are actually unable to feel pain. Um, which, when I first hear that, I'm like, oh, that would be nice, right? Man, I've gone, to, even, even at my ripe young age of 28 years old, there has been moments where I'm like, oh, I just roll out of bed and I was just not feeling all right. There was just pain going on. I was like, man, that would be nice if I could feel some pain. The only issue with that, though, is pain in theory, in a lot of ways, is a good thing because it indicates to us that there's something wrong. Um, I, I heard from this lady whose daughter had this, and, and this mom's prayer every night was that her daughter would feel pain. The reason why is because there's no cure for this. The only thing that we try to do, the goal for it, is just to maintain body temperature because if you feel like you have fever and all that stuff, you won't even know, and also just to protect them. Because they could step on a rusty nail. How many of you have seen uh, Home Alone? That one scene where one of the bandits steps on that nail. Oh, that's the worst scene of, in all movies of all time, I swear. Like, he just steps on that nail. Well, this young lady wouldn't be able to feel it. And if there was, like, some rust or an infection that grew, she wouldn't know. And so you have to protect this person. There's no cure for it. See, pain is an ultimate indicator that something is wrong. It says, don't touch that, right? You put your hand on a hot stove. Oh, nope, I don't touch that. You know, you step on a nail, nope, my foot doesn't go there. It says that something needs to be adjusted. There needs to be a correction. That's what pain indicates. But that, that, that's, that's also just a physical pain. Many of you, no doubt, experienced a mental pain of some sort, whether that's anxiety, depression, other, other stress, maybe even heartbreak. That's not necessarily a physical pain, but it's, it's a mental pain. It's, it's sort of somewhat of a spiritual pain that you can experience. Now, these, all of these things, the mental pain and the physical pain, this would all be considered under what I want to call suffering. And now, I don't have to tell you that suffering exists, right? That's probably one thing that we're sure of, is that suffering, yep, that's out there, that exists. Everyone suffers. But why? 
Many people, including Christians, struggle with that question, why do people suffer? Ravi Zacharias refers to this as the trilemma. We might ask ourselves, okay, but if God is all-powerful and God is love, why do good people suffer from bad things? John, Mac- John MacArthur says it this way. I, he just says, why do bad people, why do all people suffer bad things? Not just the good people. Why does anybody suffer from a bad thing? The first thing that we have to do in order to deal with this question of suffering properly, though, is understand that God is sovereign. So we did that last week. We're not quite there yet. We did that last week. All of this message, I told you this is pretty much just one long message from last week into this week. We have to understand that God is sovereign, that God is in control. See, if we don't understand that, if we don't see God as all-powerful and and as ultimately just all-sovereign, all of our answers will fall short to what suffering really is. We might say, well, God just can't control evil. Or, or God, he, he just, he, he, you know, he, he doesn't have control in this area. It's our sin. It's overpowered. If we don't understand that God is in all, in all control, our answers will fall short. Last week, we saw that he is in control of everything, right? What he wills will happen. And no one or no thing can stop his purposes. So that's something we had to learn last week, and that's what we really needed to focus on. So where does that leave us with suffering? If God is in control, why is there suffering? Turn to 2 Corinthians, or in 2 Corinthians, chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So you may have noticed my sermon title is, is the next headline in the series called Miracle Cure Discovered. What will it cost you? I'm sure many of us are looking for cures right now, right? We're looking for either vaccines or, or medicine to help us get through this time. If some of us are we're, we're dealing some, through some really hard things, we're going through some suffering, some trials, we might want a cure for that. Might want to look at it and say, man, I wish there was a remedy to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 1. The word of God says, I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in body or out of body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. Verse 7. So to keep me from, be, uh, from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that, I should leave, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I, may, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Father God, we, we all suffer, Lord. God, this is a question that, that not only Christians, but this world has, has pondered for, for eternity. For all the time that we've had, we're not the first ones to bring this up. This isn't our our grand idea. But God, you are not a God that that is far away from our our suffering. You understand it. You became flesh and suffered with us. Lord, help us to see the purpose of suffering. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us to have open ears and an open mind. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. First thing we see here is that God uses suffering to reveal who we really are spiritually. God uses suffering to reveal our spiritual character. Go back up to verse 1. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. 
And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast. Not on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. D.L. Moody says, character is what you are in the dark. How many of you have heard that before? Character is who you are when no one is looking, when no one is there to, to kind of judge you or for you to feel like, oh, I need to look better than really I am. Character is what you are in the dark. Suffering has the ability to bring out the real you. How many of you have seen Paul Blart Mall Cop? You've seen that movie. That's a pretty funny movie. I, I like that movie. Well, there's a scene that, that, that Paul Blart is a mall cop. He's a cop at the mall or security guard. And these guys, this group of people, they break in and start robbing the mall. Uh, there, there's a bank there. They start robbing, robbing the bank. Well, in the movie, there's this guy, this pen salesman, who just acts like he is all that. Man, he sells, like, expensive pens, and he's like, man, I'm way better, especially than the security guard. And, and him and Paul Blart are kind of going after the same woman. And, and he always is trying to impress and be like, oh, my car, and oh, this, or blah, 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 all this money. He acts real impressive. Well, there's a scene where, where this lady and this pen salesman and a couple other workers, they're, they're, they're kept captive inside the bank. Well, anyway, a text goes out, and, and the, the main villain, he finds out that one of them has a phone. So he goes in there, and the, the, the girl, she has the phone. And so she, as he goes in, she hides it under her leg. And he asks, the guy said, who has a phone? Who has a phone? And everyone's just kind of like this. Then he looks at the pen salesman, and he starts walking towards him. And the pen salesman goes, she does, she does, she does, she does, right here, right here. Points over, right? Not me. He was experienced for the first time. He's like, man, someone, I might get hurt in this situation, so oh, over here. He wasn't as tough as he really was, right? He wasn't as, as manly and didn't have quite that, that, that strength that he portrayed to have. It wasn't until that incident came about that it really showed that. Corinth had been run over by false teachers. Remember when we went through 1 Corinthians and Paul was warning them, right? He said, beware of false teachers. False teachers, this is a false teacher. He just kept warning them. Well, he had visited them and, and sent another letter that we don't have in our, in our scriptures. Um, but then he sent this other letter after visiting them and said, what had happened? These false teachers, they had, they had overrun the church and, and they were speaking poorly against Paul as well. They had been leading the people in the way of a false gospel, and they were trying to turn them away from Paul the Apostle. They were making wild claims, and they were trying to lead the church away. They would say, Paul is weak. Say, Paul hasn't seen many visions as we have. All right, Paul, he wouldn't go and brag about those things, but these men, they would. they say, I had visions from God. I had all these things. they say, Paul, he may have been sent by God at first, but we have been sent to correct all of his mistakes. We are the real, we are the super apostles. So they would lead the, the church in Corinth and the people, they fell for it. They were led astray. They, they, they fell for these things where they would say, I had these visions. They fell for this boasting. All through chapters 11 and chapters 12 of 2 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with these false teachers. See, Corinth was, a, was led away by great boasting. So what Paul decides to say is that he will boast like those fools since, since the church in Corinth likes those fools. He says, fine, I'll, I'll speak to you how, how you like to be spoken to in order to show you how foolish this was. In chapter 11, verse 16 through 19, we read, I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool so that I, may, so that I too may boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence is saying not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast, for you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. In chapter 12, verses 1 through 6, Paul is referring to himself in third person. This, this passage that we just read about the man going to heaven and everything. See, Paul is saying there, he said, I've had visions. He said, I've experienced God. In fact, I went to heaven. And whether I was in a spiritual form, in a body form, I don't know. You know, I, I heard things that, that, couldn't, that, that I can't even speak to you. But I was in heaven. I had these visions. But what he says is making these claims are of no use. He says, what, is that, what good does that do you? If I tell you, yes, I had a vision of Jesus. Yes, I went to heaven. Yes, I've, I've seen all these things. What good does that do if I can't tell you the reason for it? If I can't even tell you the words that were spoken? See, what he says is these things can't be verified. And these super apostles, these false teachers, what they were doing were they were claiming things that couldn't be verified. They'd say, yes, I've been to heaven. I've had these visions. Who's to say he hasn't, Right? 
They, they, they couldn't prove it, but it also couldn't be disproved. So they were boasting about things that couldn't be verified. In verse 6, we read, Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I, am be, I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. Paul says, although I can boast as much as the others, all right, I've had visions, I've seen Jesus in the, in the flesh when he was saved, like I, I've, I've seen all these things, I will refrain because I want you to see me for who I really am and for what I say and do. That's what Paul says. In, in chapter 11, verses 23 through 28, we read, Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman. With far greater labor, far more imprisonment, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. See, it was through his suffering that the church in Corinth could see his genuine character, his genuine message from God. It was through all those sufferings, the things that he was boasting in, those weaknesses, that the church would say, Okay, yeah, you, you false teachers or you super apostles, yeah, you've had visions, but, man, you haven't really experienced much, it seems like. Your character isn't really genuine to us. Like, we see, all, yeah, you say these things, but we don't really see you live like that. Paul, on the other hand, has experienced these great things, the, the, these, these uh, incredible things that he is, he's been thrown into the sea, that he was, he was beaten and tortured, that he was, he was uh, persecuted against by his own people, and yet he still stands on the truth. He still stands by the word that he has spoken. They saw that, and, and it spoke volumes. In verse 30, if I boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. God allows suffering in your life so others can see how genuine you believe in the gospel. How genuine this gospel is. So how do we react when we enter into suffering? See, suffering, what it does is it shows our true character, and we need to see that in each other's lives? Does it show the message that we've been trying to preach? Or are we, are we just happy, good, great living Christians until suffering comes around? And then all of a sudden, all of our faith just sort of disappears. God allows suffering into our life to show the character that we really are and to see if there needs to be a change, but also for those around to see who you really are. See, especially for me, God, God would allow me to go through suffering so then you can see my character in it. So then as I stand up here and preach, it's not something that you say, man, you know, he doesn't go through anything bad because he must be a good Christian. No, you can see me in my suffering. And I pray that God would give me enough grace to have strong character in that time. So then when you see that, my words would match my actions. God allows suffering so then our character can be shown and so our witness can be made stronger. So that was the first reason. The second reason we see is God uses suffering to humble us. In verse 7 of chapter 12, So to keep me from becoming coveted because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Paul's life work was to build and start up the churches, right? That was his life work, was, was to be a missionary, to be an apostle of God, and to go out and to tell the world about Jesus. And I would say he was really good at it, too, wouldn't you think? I mean, we, we have like over half of the New Testament of his letters written to churches. See, we read all these epistles and these letters, and there was a lot of people that were impacted by his witness. You know, they chose him as, as a leader, and he, he, he spoke of God's word. As we read earlier a few verses ago, Paul had been to heaven, and he had seen Jesus. Imagine, uh, you know, some people, they ask questions like, how were you saved? When were you saved? You know, mine's pretty, pretty simple in the, in the fact that I was, you know, in the third grade, and my teacher asked and, and presented the gospel to me, and I believed. Pretty simple, right? I don't have that story that's like, you know, gone through all these different things. Paul's story, though, 
Man, imagine that. Someone's like, yeah, I was in the third grade and got saved. How'd you get saved? He's like, well, I was on the road to Damascus, and Jesus came and, and blinded me and, 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 just, and just struck me down, and I was blinded by this light, and I believed in him, and then he sent me over to this village, and I was there, and I was blind for certain days, and then this man had to come. Like this giant story, right? Man, he had something to be really be proud of. He said, I was persecuting the church, but Jesus came from heaven back here to save me. See, he, he would have these things, and, and he could be prideful. But instead, what, it, what God had allowed happen was for him to suffer with this thorn in the flesh. Now, no one knows what that is. Uh, Paul doesn't specifically say thorn in the flesh equals this, right? There's a lot of people that, that have assumptions, and, and, and you know, I think if, if we were supposed to know exactly what it was, it would have been put in the word, but it wasn't. But there are some theories around there, and I, and I like what John MacArthur says about this and, and what the context says. See, John MacArthur, he, he says that this thorn in the flesh was actually, it, it was a messenger. It was a demonic thing, a messenger of Satan, so an angel of Satan that, that was tormenting him, but not necessarily like possession. What it was was these false teachers in Corinth. It was demonic activity, and it was so much pressure and pain on Paul that it was this thorn in the flesh for him. See, it was demonic activity. These false teachers, what they were doing is they were destroying the church. They were ripping apart this place that Paul loves so much. And, 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 and he, he turned to God and, and he said, why are you allowing this to happen? See, this caused this thorn in the flesh. Satan was the immediate cause, but God was the ultimate decider of it. He allowed it to humble Paul in his ministry. And Paul says that, he says it twice in verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, and at the end, to keep me fr uh, from becoming conceited. Paul understood what this thorn in the flesh was from. See, pride, it can creep up even amongst the most humble of us. I think it would be hard for us to say, oh, no, Paul would become prideful, right? He, he's, he, he's such a great apostle. But God knew that this thorn needed to be in there. See, God didn't allow, he didn't allow it, or preventing him from sinning, by using, or he allowed this to, to prevent him from sinning, sorry. So he allowed this suffering, this flesh in his life, to prevent Paul, Paul from sinning. See, nothing can be more humbling than suffering, right? Especially something that, that you have great pride in. If that suffers, man, it, it will humble you to your core. If you, if you have maybe constructed something, or, or think back when you were a child and maybe had built something, and then if it gets destroyed, whoo, Man, you feel kind of weak, right? Paul, he loved the church in Corinth. And he was proud of it. He said, man, this is a great church. This is a place that's been planted, not by me, but by God. You know, he was, he was super proud of it. And then this, was, this, this, this false teacher was allowed to come in and destroy it. Paul worked so hard in Corinth. And he truly labored there. But only to watch it get ripped away and be destroyed. Man, that's a humbling thing. See, God in his ultimate wisdom and authority, he allowed suffering in the church of Corinth and, the, and Paul's life in order to produce humility. James chapter 4 reads, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. How do we expect God to be in our ministry and, and even in our witness if we are doing those things in our own prideful way? If it's all about us, God doesn't want any part of it. He'll resist it, but he gives grace to the humble. Charles Spurgeon says, you have two choices. You can either be humble or humbled. God will make sure that his children are humble. When that, when that happens and what we care about most falls apart in our life, it is painful, and I don't want to belittle that, but it is purposeful. So that's the second thing that we see that God uses suffering for is to humble us. The third reason for suffering is that God uses suffering to draw us to himself. Look in verse 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Paul didn't turn to his friends. Paul didn't turn to, to medicine or to therapy. He didn't even turn to his own actions or, or, or other human knowledge. What he did is he turned to God. He pleaded with the Lord. How many of you guys have pleaded with the Lord before? Right, and not just a prayer before dinner, you know, and please let this happen. Like, no, you were on your hands and knees pleading with the Lord. Paul was doing that. He did that three times in reference to this thorn in the flesh. 
He said, please remove this from me. It is too much for me. He says, I love your church. I love your gospel. I love those people there. I hate evil. I I see the destruction that it's making. I hate the destruction of your church. Please remove this from me. So the world, what they want to offer is so many worldly remedies, right? Pills. Maybe, maybe Maybe alcohol. This will help you forget about it. Maybe even counseling, and, and counseling has its, its purpose. But where we need to ultimately turn to is God. See, God, he wants us to turn to him in our suffering. Now, it doesn't always mean that it'll be fixed in our own eyes. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden everything is perfect in our own eyes. What he wants us to understand is that we need to turn to him. See, maybe, maybe this, this, uh, this suffering, maybe it is because of repentance of sin, you're needing that. Maybe it is a humbling of our prideful heart. Or maybe it's simply for us just to know that God is God. But no matter what, we need to turn to him during it. God desires a relationship with you. You don't get that in any other religion. Every other religion is about God just being up here, you know, and we're just trying to make our way into heaven. Our religion is our God loves us. He wants a relationship with us. So many times I've heard at funerals, I mean, I, I've, I've gone to a lot of funerals here, and I, and I do the sound, and, I, and I'm here for them. And I hear this from families all the time that are hugging and crying, and they say, man, it's sad that it took this to get us together. You know, it, we, we had been so far away, and it wasn't until this death that we were able to come together. Isn't it sad sometimes what we have to go through for us to come together with God? For us to to draw near to God. What blessings can do is they can bring out a prideful heart. And humans, they will take credit for it, right? Man, if, if, if there was just all these blessings and they were using their own strength, we would take credit for it. That's why we read that by grace, through faith alone, we have been saved so no one could boast. Because we would take credit for it, right? When we suffer, we seek answers. God doesn't want us to seek them in pills or or alcohol or therapy or even within ourselves. He wants us to seek them in him because he is the only answer. So that was the third reason why God uses suffering is for us to be drawn to him. The fourth reason that God uses suffering is to display his grace. To display his grace. Look with me in verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, grace is, is in, in dictionary terms, means favor bestowed. So it's favor given to someone that, that isn't deserved of, it's bestowed to them. In God terms, it's a generous gift to an undeserving and unworthy people. This is what God's grace is to us. So when when I say that, when I say, okay, suffering is to display God's grace, we might ask, well, isn't the most gracious thing God could do for us is just make the uh, the thorn in the flesh go away? Is to just take the suffering away? Right? That would be the most gracious thing. And I think some of us would ask that. Like, why is this? If God really loves me and has grace, why is he not taking this away? Let's kind of think outside the box and think what, what would happen with that if he took away Paul's thorn in the flesh. So this thorn in the flesh is removed, right? God knows this. I don't know this, but what if uh, Paul becomes prideful? Because he knows the revelations that he has. They're great revelations. Paul, ultimately, what he does is he refuses to be a suffering servant. He sees the benefits of blessings now. So he refuses to be that suffering servant. And what he does is he finds a nice place to settle down and have a little local ministry, speaking of blessing and prosperity. Paul asked three times for this to be removed. Paul pleaded, please God, please God, please God. But God knew what would happen when this was removed. So he asked God, but God responds with no. But I will turn my grace up in the matter. I will get that volume button and crank the grace up. See, what he says is this suffering is too productive and for your good and for my purposes. I will not stop it, but what I will do is I will pour my grace exceedingly so that you may bear it and endure through it. Too often we find in Christian circles the message of all things bad are from the devil. 
John MacArthur says, most people want to wander through life thinking that God brings all the good times and the devil brings all the bad times. And, and I don't understand that, and they don't understand that the bad times come at the will of God just like the good times. And the bad times are by God's design and far more productive than the good times. In Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 2, we read, But now thus says the Lord, who, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. That sounds a lot like us, right? That he is, Jesus has redeemed us. He has called us by name. We are his. In verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. God says when you're in the storms of life, or feel like you're, you're drowning by, by, by anxieties and stresses and, and suffering through all these things, I won't allow them to overwhelm you. He says, although you may face fiery trials and suffer much, you will not be consumed. God doesn't promise that you won't suffer, but he does promise that he will give you grace to make it through this time. God does not conquer in spite of evil. What God does is he conquers through it, and he makes you who you want, for who he wants you to be. The prosperity message is the message of the devil. That is a false message. I don't read that in scripture. The message of our God and of this holy word is of suffering and grace. The ultimate, the ultimate suffering that is shown was shown on the cross of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus, he was beaten and bruised for our sins. He became sin for us and died on the cross. All that we can become recipients of the grace of God through him. If this life was about, about prosperity and blessing, that wouldn't have happened. There need to be a suffering savior, and that's what God did for us. I don't know how, it was a few years ago, um, probably the first year Andrea and I were married. Uh, we had our, our friend here, our friend Chantel. She's a great friend with Andrea. And she came here and she sang a song. I don't know if you remember at all. Um, but her, her life message and something that she stands firm upon and something I probably hear from her every single day on Facebook or Instagram, whatever it is, is, man, I would not be here if it wasn't for God's grace. She sees the blessing in her life, and she's gone through some really hard times, but during those times she says, man, I see God's grace even more today. She is a great example of that, and it, it encourages and, and convicts me too, where it's like, man, I, I need to even, no, no matter what I'm going through, God has given me grace to get through this. When we suffer, we must look toward the grace of God and say, Christ suffered so that I might have grace in times like this. He suffered more than I ever could, so I will endure by, endure by God's grace and wait for him to refine me through this. I would not be who I am today if it wasn't by the grace of God. See, God, he reveals his grace to us because, yes, we may be suffering, but he gives us the ability by his grace to get through that and to, to strengthen us. I know the example, and it's used in scripture, of the refiner's fire, right? It makes something more pure, silver more pure, gold more pure. These trials, they are the refiner's fire. There's a, a great song, the refiner's fire. And it asks God to, to try me by that refiner's fire so then I may uh, come out of it a better child of God. God uses suffering to reveal his grace to us. The next thing we see is that God uses suffering to perfect his power. Verses 9 and 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul then explains where his real boasting is, right? It's in his weaknesses. Now, how many of you know that word? Where, where, uh, what's the, uh, the interview question, right? When they say, what's your weakness? And you're like, hmm. My weakness is probably I'm a perfectionist, right? It's one of those things where it's not really a weakness, but you're trying to act humble about it. Paul is literally boasting in his weaknesses, though, legitimate weaknesses. He, he said in 1 Corinthians, I don't speak with you with, with great charisma and excitement, something that the false teachers would do. He's like, I wouldn't do that. He said, I don't, I don't present to you with grand powers, all these things. 
Paul knows that in those moments, only God per- could be performing those things. And thus the ultimate power lies in God. The results lie in God. He says, I have no ability of my own. It is all God. It, was, it, was, it wasn't in my strength. It was in God's strength. And that's why I'm going to acknowledge his strength, but my weaknesses. And man, when we read through this, Paul was, in his, uh, Paul was honest, right? Paul, he had weaknesses. And Paul, he was truly, because of his suffering, crushed to nothing. He was imprisoned. He was stoned, beaten, insulted, persecuted in so many ways. Suffering truly describes his life. He knows that while he endured these things, though, they showed him to be so weak and so fragile that God was magnified and shown to be strong. See, when he was in chains and and, and, in prison and the only thing he could do was sing praises, God released him from those chains, right? He was able to leave the prison. When speaking with all beauty and eloquency of a mound of dirt, right, God still led many people to be saved and come alive again. When he was insulted, when he was despised, when he was hated, when he was more than likely just spit upon, God produced in him a a humility and a character that showed a genuine relationship with his Father in heaven. The greatest testimonies of Christians have come out of suffering, and they show the power of God. We see that in Acts with the the first martyr, Stephen, right? When he was stoned, and, and, and he pleads out to God, and God took him away, but like he was pleading with God. That was a huge testimony to those Christians there. The apostles, I, I'm pretty sure all of them were martyred, right? Jim Elliot, he's a very famous missionary that was killed. William Tyndale, Paul himself. It's commonly said the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church. There was a great time of persecution going on in the church and it, a little bit after this, and what it did is it produced more church. It was an amazing thing. When crushed to nothing, Paul became powerful. He says, you can't explain my ministry by myself. He's like, look at me. He's like, man, see all my weaknesses? They're on display. How, how could I do this on my own? He said, I came to you with fear and trembling. You saw me up here doing this whole thing, shaking, right? He said, it's only by God's power that this could have happened. It was in my weakness that God was made strong. John MacArthur also says, no one in the kingdom of God is too weak to be powerful, but many are too strong. Many are too strong. Will we let our strength get in the way of God making us powerful powerful for him? It is these God-given weaknesses and sufferings that show the power of God in our lives. Will we, will we say no? Will, will our, our pridefulness, will our strength stand up and say, nope, I'm, I'm, the suffering, I'm not going to allow it to affect me. I'm just going to bull rush through it. I'm going to do all these things, and, and I'm going to be shown strong in this. Or are you going to allow what God is doing in your life to, to break you and to mold you into more of a, a perfect servant for him so that his glory, his power may be magnified and not your own? Because I can guarantee the ministry that you will have with God's power will be far greater than the ministry of your own strength. So what's the cure? We started off with this, right? We said, man, there's suffering out in the world. We need a cure for this. Derek, you said there is a cure discovered. What is it? What is suffering, though? Suffering produces spiritual character. Suffering produces humility. Suffering, it draws us to God. Suffering, it display God's grace in our life. And suffering, it, per- it perfects God's power in us. So what is our cure from that? I don't want to be cured from suffering. I don't want a quick solution for my suffering. I want to count it all joy in my suffering. In James chapter 1, starting verse 2, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So what's the cure that I would prescribe to to suffering? The cure is endurance. That's a miracle cure that I would prescribe for it, being a a doctor that I am. (laughs) 
Endurance, what it does is it produces a more complete child of God lacking nothing. It may last a long time. Man, some of us, they, they, we can suffer for years and, and decades, maybe even your whole life. And it may never be removed until we get to heaven. Sometimes it is. Some people, they, their suffering is removed, and sometimes they die within it. But as Romans 8, 18 reads, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. I don't want to make little of any of our suffering because you guys are suffering. There are people that are suffering, and I, and I could never speak of, of the things that you suffer through. But I would plead with you, endure through it. God has a plan for it. And I can't tell you right now what that plan is. I couldn't tell you what the reason is. God does, though. God has a reason. And, and yes, it, it, may be, it may be hard. I know it will be hard. But God knows what it is. God knows what it's like. He became flesh and he suffered. He became a servant and suffered unto death, the death of a cross. He knows what pain is like. He knows what suffering is like. So I beg you, just endure through this. Because God has a great plan for you. And, and even, like I said, if it doesn't come to a fruition in our life here, it does not compare to the glory that is to be revealed to us in heaven. Let's pray. Father, you are, you are so good to us. I even heard a question this week about if God was gracious and loving, why did he allow us to endure so much when Adam, Adam and Eve sinned. Father, you were so merciful to us. We are so undeserving of your grace, Lord. But God, you are good to us. And when we suffer, when we go through hard, terrible, unimaginable things, Lord, you are there and you are in control. God, you show us grace through those things so that we might endure that we might come out and, and reflect the light of your son even better. Father, come for those that are suffering right now. Give them peace in this time, Lord. Help them to endure, and you promise that you will, that you will be there with us through it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.